Hi, I'm Diane Brady with Forbes. We're here with Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett, who, among other things, is um, the founder, is that right, of the Caucus for Black Entrepreneurship? Uh, so it's, uh, it's good to be here with you. Yes. Uh, myself and two other members are the co-chairs and founders of the Congressional Caucus on Black Innovation. Black Innovation. So what was the need for that? Because it's relatively recent. Sure. We just launched um, this spring, and we've been working furiously um, since then to try and um, pull together an action list for us because the issue is really vast and really trying to narrowing it. We saw uh, during the pandemic particularly how important innovation was. Um, and I think once we come out of something like a pandemic and with the new Competes Act that the president has put forward, that Congress has agreed to um, on both sides of the aisle and both chambers, that we want to continue to be competitive, <clears throat> I, we recognize that a major component missing in American innovation are black innovators, uh, black creators, black founders. Uh, you know, there are some amazing statistics that show just how little support is being given to black founders and black creators. Uh, What's because, the role of Congress in that? Because I understand, we always look at, you know, education as a component, sure, funding as sure. a component. What's the, what, why the need for a caucus? You well, you know, um, as, I, as I keep putting this phrase to people that Congress can be a force multiplier. Mm -hmm. um, I sit on the Ways and Means Committee and federal tax policy is something that can drive wealth and it can also dry it up. Um, An American federal policy over the years, over the centuries, has really been able to create wealth uh, as well as to keep people out. When you look at things like the GI Bill, which supported tremendous growth in home ownership but not for GIs for coming GIs. back, yeah. but not for black GIs. 1.2 million black veterans coming back after World War II were unable to access the GI Bill, although they qualified for it. Or the Homestead Act, which, you know, after the Civil War, um, allowed white uh, landowners to amass over 270 million acres and 10% of the United States landmass. Um, the New Deal, right? Where we decided that we were, there were so many people who had mortgages that were about to go in eminent foreclosure. Uh, and so we created a mechanism to be able to buy those mortgages and then give them at much more agreeable terms, but blacks were not able to access that. So here so we Congress are. Congress has that role to do that now, I think, as well. Well, it's because, you know, circa 2022, we're two years post George Floyd, Black mm. Lives Matter. Did that make any meaningful difference? Because it was supposed to. I think the, the difference that it made is that it put in the minds of people that something is wrong in our system. Uh, that, you know, we had this tremendous black president and black uh, family, and people wanted to believe that everything's okay. We're in a post-racial society. But I think George Floyd reminded us that, no, we're not, because there are systemic issues that were never addressed. And what I think was really great about the George Floyd is that black people knew that intuitively because of their own lives. Yeah. But I think that we have an allyship with white people as well now. I, you know, I look at my daughter and her class and her friends discussing this, that we have an opportunity. But that window of opportunity is for a specific period of time. And I think we want to harness that energy and that, uh, that accountability uh, to make sure. Because Congress also has the ability to call people on the table, right? And we have major corporations, whether they are tech, whether they are business, in all of the spaces, as well as uh, investment houses, investment banks, that have said they're gonna make a commitment after George Floyd. Uh, and so it's up to us, members of Congress, for our constituency and the American people to see if that's in fact getting to where they said it wants to go. You know, it, we talk a lot about the polarization of society, certainly the polarization we see in Congress, it's interesting, you started your career as a Republican. Mm -hmm. Under George Bush, you pivoted to being a Democrat. Mm -hmm. What better person to ask about the opportunities for bipartisanship in this area? You know, um, that's a great question, and it's something that's longed for. Are you optimistic? 
Uh, unfortunately, I'm not right now. Uh, you know, and it's so interesting because when I came to Congress, uh, my old bosses were still there. I worked for Lamar Smith, who was a member from Texas, a Republican. Uh, I worked for Rob Portman, who's now a senator. I mean, I still call him boss when I see him as a staffer uh, addresses their member. But uh, with from 2012, when I first ran, to now, uh, members do not meet uh, in the same way that they do. And we also don't have members, as many members, who are moderate on either side of the aisle. Um, we have lost many of our blue dogs. Uh, while we do have a large number of moderate New Dem members, of which I am, we don't have that same number on the Republican side as well. And those Republicans who actually would like to meet in the middle with us, um, I, I think have a hesitancy and a fear of doing so right now. I, I have to pivot when you say that to January 6th. Mm -hmm. Give us some perspective as to what does that tell you? I know that you were a House manager mm -hmm. during one of the impeachment, one of the impeachment uh, proceedings. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was very emblematic again of, of sort of this bubble that some people are living in. Can you give us some perspective in terms of is it helpful to have those hearings? you think it's moved us forward in, in the issues you're talking about? Well, you know, the impeachment itself was to bring immediate accountability um, for the actions that happened on January 6th. And many people are have forgotten that the impeachment managers, myself included, along with the speaker, wanted to execute that trial uh, immediately after the, it happened yeah. and before the president left office. That did not occur. But one of the things that I think has been really great about what is happening through the January 6th Select Committee is that they have had an enormous amount of time to collect evidence, to subpoena witnesses, to have discussions, to see the breadth and depth of the engagement of the president and his uh, staff and members of his uh, administration to the lead up to January 6th and thereafter. And I think what's really informative is that people are hearing it in their words, not in the words of Democrats, but in the words of Republicans and those individuals who swore uh, an oath to support the Constitution and to be a part of the president's administration. Um, you know, over 20 million people watch the first hearing, which I think is phenomenal and brings it to life, but also mapped out an outline of what was happening during that time. Uh, the formation of the lie about the lost election, the pressure that was exerted upon individuals in state government, as well as the vice president, and the actual engagement of creating a mob and then directing them at the Capitol. Um, and the reason that they were going to the Capitol was not to protest. It was to stop something that was happening on that specific day right. at that specific time. Right. Um, and so my real hope also is that the committee will come up with recommendations to make sure that this can't happen again. Uh, and I'm hopeful along the way that particularly for those of us who were members of Congress then and now, there's a healing process and in, a, in that accountability so that the trauma of what happened for the officers, the staff, we have young staffers that were there at that yeah. time, um, that they as well can heal and our country can heal. So I want to get back to, you know, when we talk about um, innovation and, and specifically the Caucus on Black Innovation, mm -hmm. it, we talk about the need for systemic change. Systemic mm -hmm. change is not iterative. Mm -hmm. and. So how do you get to where we need to go? Because these issues have been discussed for so long, mm -hmm. as you say, there have been a multiplicity of instances mm -hmm. where people have been denied. You know, you black farmers today, right, you know, right. 100 years ago. What is it going to take in terms of the remedy? And what do you think, what are the factors that you think could feasibly come together to drive change right now, given the environment we're in? Well, you know, we know that we need to attack this on multiple fronts, whether it's in wealth creation, whether it's in education, whether it's access to data, um, you know, closing the digital divide in urban areas and communities, bringing access to capital in the form of government contracting or even investor funding, as well as education uh, at the lower school levels to interest young people in STEM, interest them in technology, uh, and create an, an ecosystem. And government has roles in each one of those that we want to play, but we also want to be an access point 
for those individuals out there who are doing this even better than we are. We, we're not trying to recreate the wheel. Um, government uh, thought and the, and the hope of government, uh, in the words of a Virgin Islander, um, Alexander Hamilton, is to be a framework on, on which the American ingenuity, innovation, and capitalism can continue to grow and keep us the greatest country. Can I ask one other thing, which is about legal remedies? You uh -huh. are a lawmaker. We're living in a time where we're seeing, certainly from the Supreme Court side, things under threat, including potentially next mm -hmm. year affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And that has been an important driver of equity. What is the role right now of Congress, and do you do you think that there are particular legal remedies that can be put in place sure. to get us where we need to go? Sure. Um, you know, as a lawmaker, it, what, one of the frustrations that I have as a member of the House is that the House is doing enormous amount of work, whether it comes in voting rights, um, protection of women's bodily rights, uh, protections of um, against police brutality that have all passed the House. And then now they're sitting in the Senate. So you have and to I become think, a senator now. Oh, <laughs> you find a state for me, and then maybe we can have a conversation. But one of the things that we are looking for, uh, and you know, the Democrats in particular, are to increase the number of senators that are uh, Democrats, so that we have a larger margin to be able to pass those laws, to put those things on the books. You know, you talk about Roe v. Wade. We're looking to see what is the Supreme Court is going to do about that. Uh, the House passed a legalization of abortion to codify it, so it's something that yeah, the Supreme yeah. Court can't take away. And those are the things that we're going to have to do. But I think it's really up to the American people to galvanize themselves to ensure that we, as the elected individuals of the people, are doing the real will of the people. So, last question in terms of when we're addressing black entrepreneurs themselves, mm -hmm. so much of entrepreneurship and innovation is about optimism, mm. about feeling that tomorrow is better mm. than today. Mm. And when you're in a time where you feel like you're not getting the traction you mm -hmm. had expected to see or we mm -hmm. had expected to see, what's the message to them? Because you, you cited some statistics that really are not heartening. Well, you know, um, things have been worse. And we are in a continuum of growth um, as black people in this country. And that hard work and the things that have been obstacles have always been a means for us to be even better, right? And so my optimism is that the things that normal people would see as struggles are the things that allow black people to continue to be great. Um, you know, is it Ernest Hemingway that said, uh, the best are those people who in their broken places are the places that they become stronger. Yeah. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that same occurs for the black innovators and creators that are out there who are doing amazing work, that they recognize that there are those of us in positions of authority that are here to support them and that hoping that they can continue with their creativity. Great. Congresswoman, thank you very much. Thank you.